and Edgar D. Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon. And after years of research, their verdict is unequivocal. I happen to be privileged enough to have uh, be in on the fact that we have been visited on this planet. And the UFO phenomenon is real, although it's been covered up by our government for quite a long time. <laughs> Whoa! Hang and, on a minute, but well, this is big. Uh, so, I, 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 I'm, whoa, this, this is, this, all of this is quite a shock to me. Well, I'm sorry, you haven't been reading the papers recently. It's starting to open up quite a bit. So you're telling me, <laughs> well, there's a lot of information to take on board. Hang on a minute. Um, I, I mean, listen, I've, I've heard, like, uh, you know, crazy UFO nuts tell me this kind of thing before. I've never had Dr. Ed Mitchell, uh, uh, you know, the, the sixth man to walk on the moon, uh, a respected scientist in his own right, uh, announced to me that, that we've been visited by aliens from uh, other planets and that they, they definitely are out there. There's no debating it. Well, that's the first time you've ever talked to me or I've told you about it before. <laughs> Good day, and welcome to Changing Your Worldview. Today we're going to talk about a recording that happened in 2012. In an after interview, supposedly the cameras were turned off, he thought, where he discusses extraterrestrials. We're going to watch that video and then just have a little chat. First, let's just have a little background on Dmitry. So, Dmitry was the president of Russia from 2008 to 2012. He was a one-term president. He was a candidate of a science degree in private law, and he was a member of the Soviet parliament. So that's just a little background on him to give you his credentials and to show you that he's at least a person of some stature. Let's jump into the video. This is going to be a short one. Знаете, абсолютно все. Ну вот, например, прилетали на Землю инопланетяне, те самые зеленые человечки. Блин, значит, рассказываю вам первый и последний раз. Вместе с передачей чемоданы с ядерными кодами президенту страны приносят специальную папку. На ней написано совершенно секрет. И она целиком и полностью посвящена пришельцам, которые посетили нашу планету. Одновременно предоставляется доклад от абсолютно закрытой спецслужбы которая занимается контролем пришельцев на территории нашей страны. Значит, две эти папки передаются вместе с ядерным чемоданом. После прекращения полномочий, соответственно, эти папки передаются новому президенту. Более подробную информацию на эту тему вы можете получить, посмотрев известный хроникально-документальный фильм «Люди в черном». Вышло несколько версий. Сколько их среди нас? Не Сколько их среди нас рассказывать не буду, потому что это может вызвать панику. The reason I have three articles today is because before the video that we just watched, he was talking about Father Christmas. Um, that's just their equivalent of Santa Claus, and I don't know why they were talking to him about Santa Claus, but he gave a quote and here's the quote I believe in Father Frost but not too deeply but anyway you know I'm not one of those people who are able to tell the kids that Father Frost does not exist he said in a jovial reply to a question about Russia equivalent of Santa Claus now we all know that Santa Claus isn't real but I think that it's more or less he's just trying to put the open-minded opinion out there of you would be surprised of what could be real in this world. We agree that anything is possible in today's world. Let's move on to the next article and it's from Sky News. Sky News is a UK newspaper. Um, again, the Father Christmas thing. The only reason I'm gonna even I even brought up this other article is because this one did make mainstream news, but every single one of them, they were just trying to discredit him. And I think that maybe even the whole entire Father Christmas story is just a misdirection so people won't pay attention to what he had to say about extraterrestrials. If in that video you were listening when he said the well-documented um, documentary Men in Black 
and everybody laughed, they were probably laughing and they were making fun of him in a lot of the articles I read because they thought he was talking about the movies Men in Black that we all watched. Um, but in reality, he was talking about a documentary called Men in Black. But it only verifies his standing even more because there really is a documentary. It's Russian called Men in Black. Thank you for coming and watching this episode of Changing Your Worldview. Don't forget there will be a part two uploaded shortly after this one of the Russian documentary, and I hope you all take the time to watch it. Trust me, it's a good watch if you like documentaries, and it's not as long as a traditional documentary. I know it has subtitles, but as always, the truth isn't easy to come by. So have a great day, and thank you for coming. Much appreciated. Okay, so let's uh, th let's get into the presentation now. This is Dr. Haim Ashed. He is uh, reported to be 87 years old. This is from the Smithsonian Institute website. Uh, it's important to mention that they don't certify and validate anything that's there. Um, I, I think that Dr. Ashed or people who back him are supporters of the Smithsonian. So... Uh, none of these things are verified or validated according to Ms. Smithsonian, but it says he's a professor of aeronautics and astronautics. He's a pilot and flight instructor. Um, he's a member of the American Institute of Aeronautics and, and uh, Astronautics. And this is the one that I want you to focus on. He's the co-founder of the Israel Space Agency. He was instrumental um, in launching Israeli satellites, and he was one of the co-founders of the Space Agency for Israel. And um, they did that in association with Technion, which is one of the leading um, uh, technological institutes in the world. So this is not a, um, let, let's put it this way, this is from the Israeli perspective, probably one of the most credible people in space agency in Israel, and he would be one of the leading guys in the world in this particular area. This is from Linda Moulton Howe. She's been uh, from her site called Earth Files. She's been doing this work for quite a long time. She gives some additional information. Um, um, the interview that was originally done was in a, mag in a magazine called Yediot Ara. Aharonoth, which is um, where the original interview was uh, was given of the information you're going to see today, but we're going to see it from the perspective of the Jerusalem Post, uh, which is once again a very credible um, um, news outlet in Israel. It says that he served from 1981 to 2010 as the head of Israel's security space program. Obviously, for the Israelis, because they have so many enemies, satellite technology is by defect or, or by by just automatically is going to be associated with their security. And obviously, the, the satellites are doing that for them. It says that he received uh, three uh, awards for called the Israel Security Award and twice were for confidential technological inventions that he made. So he's obviously an inventive person. He got his bachelor's degree in electronics engineering at, at Technion. That would probably be our electrical engineering. He's got an MS, and then he did his uh, PhD in aeronautical engineering, and I understand that he did that in the United States. He served in the Technological Institute of the Israeli Defense Force Intelligence Division. And in 1969, he was sent by the IDF to study his PhD in aeronautical engineering in the US, um, which obviously he did. And he's been a leading person um, in the uh, Israeli military and technology apparatus for a while. Um, he reached the rank, as, as I understand it, of general. So it says lieutenant colonel, but I understand he's a general. And he is currently serving as a professor in uh, at the university. And he's about to write a book. And this is what this is about.
Now, when he made the announcements that he made, um, most of the media re re uh, reactions to it were, um, I guess the only way I could describe it, this is just my <laughs> estimation, is they were goofy. Um, it wasn't all of them, but most of them were focused on the idea where they interpreted what he was saying, that the focus of what he was saying is that aliens were hiding among mankind, which for anyone that's done any extensive uh, research or understanding of this material is kind of silly because um, probably virtually everyone comes from off world. And so hiding among whom and who's the one hiding and who's not, it's all rather silly. But this of course is, how some of these news media outlets are trying to get people's attention. The thing that is mentioned is he uses a term, and we're going to talk about this, and it's probably the most important thing about our presentation today. He mentions that the communication between the United States and Israel is with an entity called Galactic Federation. So let's repeat that again. He makes the claim that the interaction with the Earth humans from the United States, Earth humans from Israel, is with an entity called the Galactic Federation. And that's what we're going to talk about. NBC News um, coverage of this uh, was actually not all that bad. Um, and uh, they make the statement that he's a respected professor and retired general. Um, and he talks about this idea that the aliens are curious about us and are seeking to understand the fabric of the universe, which is a good description. And they mentioned that a shed is the one who oversaw the launch of Israeli satellites. And so he's obviously got a very deep connection to the um, space agency in Israel. The one we're going to focus on is going to be from the Jerusalem Post, and this is a capture from the article that they had on this, which is entitled, Former Israeli Space Security Chief Says Aliens Exist and Humanity Not Ready. This Galactic Federation, which he talks about, was supposedly been in contact with Israel and the U.S. for years, but are keeping themselves a secret to prevent hysteria until humanity is ready. Okay, so he, these are extracts from this actual article, and the inter original interview uh, was done in this other magazine, as we had uh, said before. For the Israelis, they're all going to be familiar with who this guy is, and they know that he is a credible person, so they're going to treat him seriously, even though we as Americans perhaps have never heard of this guy. I've never heard of him, but obviously people in Israel will have heard of him and the, his accomplishments. So he explains that Israel and the U.S. have been dealing with aliens for years. That in itself is not, shall we say, very surprising. But of course, to have someone come out and say this is important. So I want to emphasize that the focus of our discussions on these particular issues is not for us to say that, you know, we're, we're revealing something that's really cool, new, and interesting, because the ufology community has been covering this for a long time. They've uncovered all kinds of interesting information, but these are official channels of credible people who are coming out and essentially validating what a lot of people have suspected for a long period of time. And the idea is for us to think about what this means for the direction of humanity, what this means for the future of our country, the United States of America, and also what this means for your life and how the life of you, the life of your children and or grandchildren, if you have them, how it's all going to change in a very short period of time. Now, we've been doing these uh, presentations on this disclosure since July, August of this year, so 
we went into September, October. Here it is December. Today's December the 13th of 2020. And this stuff is, keeps coming out. So it's important for us to stay on top of this and realize that this disclosure is inevitable. It's inevitable that this is going to occur. And this is just another milestone on the road. He makes the statement, which I think is very interesting, is that if he had said this five years ago, he would have been put in some form of type of institution. But he said today things are different because the world is different. And also he is he's at a point he's 87 years old. He's gotten all of his awards. He's a recognized authority. He doesn't have he doesn't have any access to grind. He's not worried about what people are going to think about him. And it's also coincidental. He's writing a book called The Universe Beyond the Horizon. And this book obviously is part of this promotion. Some people think that he's doing this to promote his book. Yeah, of course, that's kind of obvious. But as someone who's a little on the older side myself, um, what's important for someone his age is his legacy. And the other thing, too, is he's part of the military intelligence apparatus. These guys never do things accidentally, ever. They just don't. He's not going to come out and say this unless he had approvals at very high level. And it's not about him promoting his book. I'm sure at 87, he's not so worried about that. I think it's probably more like this is part of a coordinated program of some sort to release this information. That's my view. I may be reading the tea leaves a little bit, but I'm very confident that that's true. There's something about this information that's being released now that's important as part of this disclosure narrative. So what he talks about is something, once again, that the, um, uh, extra, the extraterrestrial investigators, the ufology community, has been aware of for some time. We're most familiar with the agreements that we believe were done by Dwight Eisenhower when he was president, that we've reached agreements with these extraterrestrial beings, and in particular, agreements that were done by the United States. Now, um, they make a big deal in the article, and people have brought out this idea that, they're, that we have secret underground bases on Mars. Once again, this is not going to be a surprise whatsoever. There's people who have been involved with these bases on Mars. Um, the idea that we're operating these bases and, and even craft with extraterrestrial beings, once again, not going to be a surprise to anyone particularly. We're aware of this. But the fact that this is being credibly released by a credible individual is obviously very interesting. So this idea that we're going to explore Mars and we've got the little rover running around and you know bumping into rocks and things and people are looking at rocks and seeing if they can see the face of things um, is all rather moot compared with the idea that we already have bases on Mars. That's what he's saying. And that the bases are being manned together with alien representatives. That's what he's saying. As an Israeli intelligence official, that's what he knows to be true. Now, the important thing in this, and I want to point this out, is that he mentions that the discussions going on with Israeli officials and American officials is with an entity called a Galactic Federation. I cannot emphasize to you enough in this presentation how important that is. In other words, they're dealing with an organization or entity of off-world beings, and they're going entity to entity. So Israel represents a country on Earth of made up of millions of people. The United States is a country on Earth made up of millions of people. They are discussing with a group called Galactic Federation. He doesn't, clear, doesn't give us a lot of clarity on that, but that's who he's dealing with. 
So let's just pause and think about that just for a moment, that what's now being revealed to you is that there is an organization of off-world, non-human, Earth-human beings that are negotiating with our governments and having discussions with them about various things. Now, on the issue of disclosure itself, what um, Professor Ashed is telling us is that, yes, there is going to be the disclosure. We're going to become part of the galactic community. But in the opinion of this entity called Galactic Federation, we're not ready yet. That's what he says that they have told us. They're cons the Galactic Federation, he says, is concerned about mass hysteria since because of, of the where we are as Earth humans. But he also says something very interesting as well. Donald Trump is aware of them. He's our president. He was on the verge of disclosing the Galactic Federation to the world, but the Galactic Federation stopped him from doing so. And they give the reasons for what it is. He's very specific as to where our shortcomings are, and that is that we need to evolve and reach a stage where we will understand what space and spaceships are. So the implication of this statement is that until and unless we as a human race get to the point where this understanding is well understood, they feel that they're not ready to disclose their presence to us. Um, and this is what he's reporting. Okay, so now let's summarize uh, what I consider to be the material things in this disclosure, which are milestones of a sort. Donald Trump is engaging in discussions with non-Earth humans, but it's not a particular race. Many people have talked about a so-called alien invasion, or we're talking to greys, or we're talking to reptilians, or we're talking to whoever. It is not a race that they're talking to. It's a federation of many races. That is extremely important. But he's engaged in those discussions on behalf of the United States. The other thing that's important as you can see from this, is he responds to their directives. Now, does that mean that the Federation is deciding what the United States does? I'm not saying that. What I am telling you, the important thing about this, is that they're negotiating with each other as, as uh, representatives of a particular entity, and they agreed he wanted to reveal their presence. They agreed mutually, however they came to that agreement, that they were not going to do that. Okay, and the last thing is that these non-Earth humans have an organization called Galactic Federation. It's Im extremely important to realize what that means is that it's not a particular alien race. It's not a particular off-world group of intelligent beings that these discussions with Israel and, and the United States are having. It's an organization called Galactic Federation. Exopolitics.org. Let's, <clears throat> let's go to, um, to our esteemed Honorable Paul Hellyer of uh, Canada. We would uh, give you 20 minutes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, uh, Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak, and uh, thank you, Steve, for the invitation. My name, as I said, was Paul Hellyer. I'm a former Minister of National Defense for Canada. I served in three governments during a total of 23 and a half years as a member of Parliament. Although as Minister of National Defense, um, I had sighting reports uh, of UFOs, uh, I was too busy to be concerned about them at the time because I was trying to unify the Army, Navy and Air Force into a single Canadian Defence Force and that itself was a kind of uh, battle to the finish. So um, this was not high on my agenda. 
but about 10 years ago, I started getting interested uh, due to a young man from Ottawa sending me material on the subject. I told him I was too busy to read it, but he had confidence that someday I would. He sent me a copy of um, Colonel Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. It took me a while to get around to reading it, but I took it uh, for my summer reading in 2005 and um, was really impressed with what was contained in it. And what I thought to myself is there are huge issues here, huge issues. And the American people and the people of the world have a right to know what's going on because they're part of it. It's not just an isolated thing. And so after confirming the contents of the book with a retired uh, United States Air Force general, I accept the invitation of Victor Vigiani, uh, who is over here somewhere, and his uh, cohort, uh, Mike Bird, to speak to a symposium at the University of Toronto. And uh, I said, UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. That gave me the dubious distinction of being the first person of cabinet rank in the G8 group of company, countries uh, to say so unequivocally. <laughs> Since then, I've learned a lot from many sources, including a number of the fantastic witnesses that we have heard these last four days. They were so outstanding, I was just really blown away with them, uh, the amount of information that was available. And I appreciate uh, every single one of them. But because I'm not a ufologist, um, I'm a politician, there are only a few things that I want to add in that particular realm. <clears throat> First is that about um, in the 1960s sometime, there was a flotilla of UFOs headed south that crossed into NATO territory in Europe. And um, the commander-in-chief of uh, the Supreme Allied, Allied uh, Headquarters in Europe, uh, was naturally very shaken. Uh, fortunately, or maybe divine providence, before um, the panic button was pushed, the flotilla turned around and headed back north. Uh, obviously, they had thought maybe they were Russian and they were very concerned about it. Anyway, uh, uh, <clears throat> an investigation was launched into this whole subject, and uh, a document was prepared which uh, concluded that at least four species had been visiting Earth for thousands of years. And this is my own uh, view at this stage as well. So, except for that, there are just a couple of um, things that we've talked about that I'd like to refer to. And one uh, was that we've we're referring to them as they until this morning when Linda Moulton Howe, I think she was the first one, actually named three different species. I have brought my uh, latest book uh, called Light at the End of the Tunnel, a survival plan for the human species as an aid memoir. And uh, I named five different uh, species here. I'm aware of uh, more now. As a matter of fact, I saw a document uh, just a few days ago that mentioned 20. Uh, and I think you, Mr. Chairman, were interested in some of the places they might come from. And I have in here Zeta Reticuli, R-E-T-I-C-U-L-I, Reticuli, the Pleiades, Orion, and Romita, and the Altair star systems. So uh, I don't think we can any more refer them to them as they because they're not an amorphous mass. They are different species and consequently may have different agendas. I don't think we can say that they all have the ag same agenda any more than we could say that the United States, uh, China, and, uh, and Russia had the same ag agenda. Our real interests may be very similar, uh, but as of now, our perceived interests are still uh, quite far apart. One more observation before I begin what I want to say. 
and that is that we spent quite a bit of time talking about the 66-year-old cadavers. And I was glad to have Linda this morning finally say that there are live ETs on Earth at this present time, and um, at least two of them probably working with the United States government. I, the seventh, the other species that I learned about uh, not too long ago was called the tall whites. And uh, this is when Paula Harris uh, broke the story just a few years ago. And through her good offices, I had the chance to talk for about three hours with former airman Charles Hall and uh, listen to this absolutely fascinating story of uh, how he was working with, first of all, he was scared out of his skin, but after that, when he got to know them, how he was working with, and finally they became to trust each other and have a good working relationship with the tall whites at the uh, gunnery range at Indian Springs in Nevada. And these tall whites were living on United States Air Force property and working in cooperation with the United States Air Force and sharing technology with them. He wrote a book, incidentally, called Millennial Hospitality. There are four different versions, but uh, Paula says that uh, Millennial Hospitality uh, number two is the best. I think that's the one I read, and it's a, it's a very interesting read uh, if you want to sort of get inside the, the problem of what it's like to bump into these people floating across the, uh, the terrain in the, in the desert. <coughs> well, enough on that for now. My interest is in full disclosure. And uh, I just, my only caveat is, I think probably I would say 95 to 98 percent full disclosure. I know of one or two things that I'm not sure should be in the public domain, at least yet. They will be someday, I'm sure, but not maybe immediately. But just as children survive uh, the idea of the uh, tooth fairy and Santa Claus when they become adult, I think that taxpaying citizens are quite capable of accepting the new and broader reality that we live in a cosmos teeming with life of various sorts. The fact that some other civilizations are more advanced than we are may be humbling, but that could be a necessary step in our survival. The world is an unholy mess. We have it best until the end of this decade. In my book, I said we have 10 years to stop global warming if we don't want it to be beyond the point of no return. Two years has gone past since it was written, so I say we have until the end of the decade to arrest global warming. Yet our leaders don't even talk about it very much except in a superficial way. They appear to be more interested in starting wars to control more oil and in effect prolong the gravity of the threat. Of course, even if they took the problem seriously, they wouldn't have the finances to finance the transition from oil to the clean economy, to clean energy, because we have an infinitely silly banking and financial system in the Western world. And the United States Congress, I regret to say, is partly responsible, and I'd be glad to uh, elaborate on that later if you're interested. And finally, they need the technology for clean energy. And it exists, and it's being kept secret by the same vested interests who control our destiny. Who are these vested interests, and what are they up to? Well, Senator, you we're talking about a military junta. In my opinion, that is true, but I have broadened and deepened the definition uh, to cabal, and the cabal comprises members of the three sisters, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers, and the Trilateral Commission, the International Banking Cartel, the oil cartel, members of various intelligence organizations, and select members of the military junta, who together 
have become a shadow government of not only the United States, but of much of the Western world. The Council on Foreign Relations is the oldest of the three sisters, and uh, as early as October 1940, years before Germany surrendered to the Allied armies and to vaporize Hitler's vision of empire, the Council's economic and financial group drafted a memorandum outlining a comprehensive policy, quote, to set forth the political, military, territorial, and economic requirements of the United States in its political potential leadership of the non-German world, including the United Kingdom itself, as well as the Western Hem Hemisphere and the Far East. The Council made absolutely no effort to disguise uh, where is that? Right next uh, P. Yeah. The Council made no effort to disguise the fact that the purpose of the Grand Area and later world hegemony was to support an expanding U.S. economy, to provide it with raw materials and markets for its products. This was labeled the national interest, quote unquote. It was equally clear that the national interest was the interest of the ruling elite whose members comprised the Council. The real interests of the majority of rank-and-file Americans was never a factor in the, equa in the equation. So, um, Mr. David Rockefeller, who was a member of all three of the sisters, is quoted as saying this. Serious interest in the UFO phenomenon? Well, not until about 12 years ago. That's uh, like uh, being 2005. Actually, um, for some months before that, a young uh, bilingual chap from Ottawa, by the name of Pierre Junot, and, uh, interestingly enough, coincidentally, I got a, an email from him this morning, um, was sending me material and I was honest with him. I said, Pierre, I haven't got time to read it. And he was very patient with me and said, well, why don't you just put it on a shelf for a rainy day? And I decided, well, that was the least that I could do, so I just did that. Well, then two things uh, happened. One, he asked me uh, if I would watch an ABC special uh, put together by Peter Jennings, uh, who was uh, an Ottawa boy working for ABC, and I said yes. <clears throat> and um, so I watched it, and I must say I was impressed, because here were all of these uh, former Air Force officers, uh, commercial airline pilots, air traffic controllers and policemen saying that they had seen UFOs, and I said to myself, why would they say that if they didn't? I mean, what point would there be to go on the air and lie about something, um, which in many cases would bring some ridicule, um, if, they, if they hadn't actually experienced it? So I tucked that away in, my, in the back of my head. And then the other thing, Pierre sent me a, a book called The Day After Roswell. And um, I said, oh, that would be interesting reading sometime. I only have about two opportunities a year to read books. Um, and one is at Christmas and the other is in the summer. If I take a week or two at the lake, we have a little place on uh, Lake Muskoka that my late wife and I ran as a lodge for 45 years and is still continuing now as a uh, housekeeping cabins. And uh, so I thought to myself, well, I'll just take it up there and uh, put it on my reading list. Well, when I went to go f for the holiday in, two th I guess it was 2004, um, I, I couldn't find it. And so I took uh, The Life of Pi, which I read with great interest. And I must admit that I, did, I was near the end of the book before I could tell whether it was fact or fiction. It was so well written. 
Well, in the following year, 2005, I was looking for another book and couldn't find it. And lo and behold, staring me in the face from the bookcase was the day after Roswell. So I grabbed it and took it. I started to read it. And my nephew came along and said, what are you reading? I said, uh, the day after Roswell. And he said, well, I'm a skeptic. I said, oh, you're entitled to be a skeptic. It's uh, still a free country, more or less, I'm getting less all the time. And uh, so I, f I finished the book and I said to myself, this is not f the fiction because I recognize the names of many of the generals and the airports uh, that were named in the book. I said, these are real people and I, I know about them from my days in, uh, in national defense. And uh, my nephew had gone home and he phoned me and said, uh, I, I phoned the general and told him what you were reading and he said, every word is true and more. Where can I get a copy of the book? So I told him. And um, in the meantime, and just total coincidence or serendipity, but I think, I, frankly, the way I believe, I think it was more than that. Um, I had received this invitation to speak uh, at an extraterrestrial conference in Toronto at the University of Toronto um, in September of 2005. And I had absolutely no intention of accepting the invitation. I was, I'll have to admit, I was procrastinating. I just didn't get around to it. I was, or thought I was too busy to take the time out to get in touch with the two people, Victor Vigiani and Mike Bird, who were sponsoring it, and let them know that I wouldn't be able to, uh, to accept. So, uh, it just happened that that invitation was still outstanding, and after reading the book, I said, I think maybe I should go to that conference because the issues involved here are so big, huge. The American people are paying hundreds of billions of dollars for programs that they don't know anything about. And uh, things are happening in their country that they don't know anything about. And they should know because the United States forces and uh, the Air Force, I guess, is um, in particular, sort of operate with a shoot first and ask questions after mentality. And I said, heaven knows what they could get us into. You know, if they start shooting at these things, um, they could get us in a, an intergalactic war and uh, that would be uh, probably game over for us. So I was concerned and I thought, I have a responsibility um, as someone who has had a job of uh, some authority to, uh, to say unequivocally what I believe. Well, two things I had to clear. And one was I was getting married a week to the day after the conference. I'd been married to my former wife for 59 years, but she had died the previous year. And uh, the widow of my best friend uh, was, uh, I've said that she would marry me, so I thought it was good if the two of the four people who used to spend a lot of time together over a 35 year period uh, got together and kept the flag on. So um, I had to phone her and uh, I told her what it was and I said, uh, she was not very enthusiastic, I have to admit. And I said, well, it'll just be one, one time off and um, that'll be the end of it. And I didn't mean to deceive her, as she well knows, because I had no idea what the outcome was going to be. Well, then the, the second thing is I phoned my uh, nephew and said, uh, give me the general's uh, telephone number, and give me a heads up that I'll be calling, because I thought I should check with him personally and hear his voice and what he had to say. And I had met him, so I knew who it was, and uh, so I phoned him, and before I could even say, hello, how are you, what's the weather like, he said, every word is true and more. That was, those were his opening words. 
And he spent 20 minutes telling me the end more within the limit of his oath, I guess it went as far as he could. And he said, and this was the, the most important thing he said during that period was that there have been face-to-face -face meetings between United States officials and visitors from other star systems, period. No equivocation. And so with that assurance, um, and my own conviction based on what I already knew, I said, I'll go to the meeting. And uh, at the meeting, I said mm, that UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying overhead. And that was it. After that, just the, the information that kept rolling in from all over the world, books and, and uh, documents, some classified, some not, and so on. A lot of things happened, which you're well aware. Now, what would you point at as the best uh, evidence to the people in the media that say there is no credible evidence uh, that exists to support the existence of UFOs? Is there one particular thing that really jumps out at you that you would point out? Well, to there them? are so many, actually. Um, as of today, um, if somebody just wanted to read one book to find out uh, what the score is, it would be a book called Undisclosed by uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, MD, who is one of the best ufologists in the world and has been in this business uh, for years and years and years. And the reason is because he quotes people verbatim. He quotes people who have seen them, people who have been working on extraterrestrial on sh airships to replicate the, uh, the visiting airships, uh, people who have been working in what we call the black ops, the special uh, <clears throat> projects, as they call them, but they're referred to as black ops because only a few people have any idea of what they're all about. And he has been very thorough in pointing out a lot of things that nobody else has really put their finger on and substantiated them with first-hand evidence. Now, interestingly enough, Dr. Greer was the first person to brief me after I went public. He was visiting uh, uh, Toronto and uh, I guess to make a speech and so uh, we had lunch on the waterfront and he's, he briefed me for three hours and told me some of the things that he did including briefing uh, future presidents and, uh, and chiefs of intelligence who didn't know what was going on because they weren't allowed to know and uh, gave me a lot of information and uh, this is his most recent book <coughs> He held a press conference uh, a number of years ago at the press um, building in Washington where he had a lot of these people speaking on camera. He had uh, the, one of the largest audiences ever for this kind of uh, an expose. And uh, now, of course, he's getting a much wider view with a new film and uh, with this, uh, this book, which which unlike a lot of books, including my own, are really often second-hand knowledge, which I am convinced are accurate enough to take the responsibility for. And that's the way it should be, but it's different than having eyewitnesses uh, come on. I have, I have a couple of those too, because there are a couple of outstanding cases, like the Bentwaters case, in the UK, which has been so well documented that nobody in there with any kind of intelligence whatsoever could read the latest book by uh, Colonel Halt on that uh, episode without, uh, without coming to the conclusion that it was legitimate. And, and he was one of the first, he was, as a matter of fact, the first person that I ever interviewed live um, on this subject. Uh, I was in Washington for the National Prayer Breakfast and uh, after it was over, 
I went to see him, and the only reason he would see me is because I had uh, I had stopped in uh, in London the previous year on my way to uh, to the Middle East to see what was going on there, which I recount in my book uh, Light at the End of the Tunnel, and I wanted to have seen it and talk to people firsthand before putting it in the book, which is the way I try to operate. And uh, so uh, I, w I went that way and talked to the person who had been in charge of the British uh, Armed Forces UFO desk. And he gave me this case because it had gotten into the public domain. And so, uh, as a result of that, Colonel Hall said that on his recommendation that I could, uh, he would see me. So, I talked to him for, well, on tape, for two hours, and and put a lot of it in my book because it just covered all the bases of the incredulity. Oh, don't give me that sort of thing, you know. When a report comes in, yeah, stop kidding me. This, stop wasting my time, and then. Finally, on Christmas Eve, it was or Christmas Day, I think it was Christmas Eve, when the, the sightings happened again and, and the, they were having a, a banquet to give up some, uh, some awards to members of the staff at the, uh, at the twin bases there. Um, his CO sent him out to, uh, to investigate. And he said his attitude was, I'm going out there and put an end to this nonsense once and for all. And instead of doing that, he said, it changed my life forever. He actually saw the ships. He saw the evidence of them being there, recorded it. And then after that, went through this whole realm of people destroying evidence, lying about what had happened, and all of that sort of thing. And his book, which is about that thick, uh, records his uh, memories and is worth reading if you just want a single case to, uh, to get uh, at the truth of that, as I say, one of the best documented uh, cases there, uh, there is. So uh, I, would, I would say there, there are dozens and dozens of books that have information and there's uh, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, people have weekly and, uh, and uh, other uh, reports that they put out, citing not only uh, observe, observe, observations of, of UFOs, but also of talking to people who have seen them. And uh, the, <clears throat> the chap who actually writes this uh, this report was um, himself saw a, um, an ET who had been shot on his base because they had landed there without authority and uh, as I say, shoot first and ask questions afterwards. Is there any particular reason why, I know there's numerous species of these different beings, uh, why none of them have shown themselves um, to the people of Earth. I know there's been numerous math sightings, but nothing big enough that the media has actually accepted it as fact. Well, there will never be anything big enough for the media to report because the media is compromised. It is totally corrupt. Um, and that's the reason people don't know. It's not because there's no news there. It's because the people who are supposed to be looking for the news are not looking for it. Because they've been told not to look for it and not to report it if they stumble over it. And uh, this has been going on for a long, long time. On July the 4th, 1947, there was an alleged crash in Roswell. That's the one that resulted in the book, A Day After Roswell. And the commander of the base, it was then an Army Air Corps base because it was before the United States Air Force was formed during World War II, it was the Army Air Corps. 
um, the commander of the base put out a press release saying that um, they had recovered a saucer and that was in the local press. Three or four hours later, his commander, Major General Roger Ramey, put out another press release and said, no, that was a mistake. It wasn't actually a saucer they had found. It was a Rowan meteorological balloon. And he had one there for the press to photograph. And they showed it on air. And that is the news that was reported by the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on. And in my opinion, that was the cornerstone lie of a system, a culture of constant lying. And the press has been so corrupted. In a recent book um, by uh, a chap who wrote the, the uh, true story of the Bilderbergers, his name will come to me in a minute. He cites the ownership and control of the world's English language news outlets, both print and, uh, and electronic. His name is Estulin, Daniel Estulin. And he wrote the, day, the, the true story of the Bilderbergers, but in his latest book, he has pages outlining the control of all of these networks. And every single one of them is either owned by or controlled by a Bilderberger. And the Bilderbergers, as I point out in my latest book, uh, latest two books actually, The Light at the End of the Tunnel and uh, The Money Mafia, A World in Crisis, um, is the most secretive, has become one of the most secretive organizations in the whole world, plus one of the most powerful. And they don't want people to know the truth of what's going on, and they're willing to pay to see that the truth doesn't get out. Pay big time. And that is the way the world is run. It's, it's, you know, the talk about the free press, that's the biggest joke in the world. We don't have a free press. If we had a free press, we ha would have sightings, huge reports in the papers of all sorts of things, including uh, the Armada that flew south over Europe in, I guess it was 1963, of about 50 UFOs. And the, the Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe uh, uh, was concerned and about to press the panic button. Unfortunately, they all turned around and went back over the North Pole. So he was satisfied they weren't Soviets and that they were, in fact, had to be extraterrestrial. So he ordered a uh, study to be done, and it took three years. And what the study concluded was that there had been at least four species, at least four, visiting Earth for thousands of years. This is not a new phenomenon. This goes a way, way back and predates what we call our modern history of the last 10 or 15,000 years. And uh, so did that receive widespread press? No, no. And what about 9-11? The Bush administration, the top people in the Bush administration were well aware that the attack on the towers was going to take place weeks before it happened. Isn't that news? You would think so. Have you read about it in any of the papers? Have you heard them talk about it on any of the big television networks or small television networks? No. You probably have heard 
uh, people say, well, that's just, you know, conspiracy theory. Jesse Ventura has come out about it. Yes, there, there, are, there are books coming out, and in my latest book, Money Mafia, I quote Dr. Judy Woods, who did the most thorough investigation. It is that thick. And she points out, for example, there are only two little planes hit one, two of the towers, and yet, I can't remember whether it's five or seven, there were five buildings at least that went down. Now, how do you knock down five buildings with two jets? Neither one of which had enough thermal energy or kinetic energy to bring down one of those buildings. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that. You just have to be an engineer who knows a little bit, or an architect, and a thousand of them, a thousand, one zero zero zero, architects and engineers have come out and signed a document that said the official report was not the truth, was not, in fact, what happened. Now that's news, but have you seen that reported? Only in what we call the alternate press, the kind that some of us get, uh, get our news from. So, uh, as I insist, and I, th I think it's the saddest thing that I know, and I'm, recently I saw um, a YouTube of a former FBI officer saying that his job was to buy the press. And he went into it chapter and verse of how he, he would approach uh, a paper and uh, and offer them cash, offer all sorts of good correspondence cash in order to write uh, stories that repudiated what was really going on. And this, this is hard to fight too because I have one course, I get correspondence from all over the world, thousands of emails from everywhere and my great regret is that I haven't got time to answer them all as, as carefully as I would like to, but that would take every minute of my waking time. And I've, I'm starting on my 15th and I hope last book, um, which is going to be my memoirs, and, but it has some other revelations in it too. But one of my correspondents from Hungary keeps saying that I'm not telling the truth, and he'll quote NASA. And NASA will be putting out story after story saying they've just discovered a planet which might have uh, sentient life on it. And in the Toronto Star, I think it was, had life could be found in 10 years. This is deliberate disinformation deliberate disinformation because NASA knows darn well that these things are real and that they've seen them and recorded them and they've played cover up ever since. And these stories are put out to fool people like my correspondent. And I finally just say, look, you either have to believe the liars or believe me. And that's your choice because I'm telling the truth. That's the only reason I'm here, and I don't get paid for it. So, uh, and he keeps fighting back every time he sees uh, NASA put something out. See, NASA said that uh, that these uh, things are not real, and uh, or something to that effect. And I said, well, you have to make up your mind. And somebody had quoted NASA, and I said, well, you're going to have to make up your mind whether you're going to believe the liars, which are the officials or whether you're going to believe those of us like uh, Dr. Greer and, uh, and the, the late uh, astronaut uh, Edgar Mitchell, one of my good friends. Gordon Cooper, he was another astronaut yeah, that I got on the record. Yeah, and, and, and some, some of them have come clean, but they don't get the, <clears throat> the kind of publicity that you would normally expect from someone in that position who comes out and tells the truth. Because the free press, quote unquote, does not tell the truth. And if you want to go find out what's going on in the world, 
and in the solar system and in the universe and in the cosmos, you will not get it by listening to CNN or reading the New York Times because they will not print it. This is an old trick of the rich people who run the world. Uh, Ellen Brown in uh, the U.S. is a, a friend of mine and she's one of the, the brightest people I know when it comes to money and all about it, which is my bag. That's what I'm primarily interested in. And uh, she said when the bankers persuaded Congress to give them the right to create U.S. currency a little over a hundred years ago, that Morgan Bank hired a committee to determine the 25 most influential newspapers in the United States and to buy either the papers or control of their editorial content. And you can be very sure that the cabal, as I call it, has done the same thing today. And consequently, that all of the important news that you should be getting, so that you really know what's going on, is edited out before it's seen by you. And you've mentioned uh, in some of your other interviews that uh, there's an alien interest in Earth's atomic warfare. Uh, sightings went up after the last atomic bomb was dropped. Um, do you want to just explain to us what their interests might be and what if something happens between North Korea and the U.S., which seems like a possibility, um, do you think um, there may be some extraterrestrial involvement um, should um, we go to war, basically? It is one of the primary issues of our time. And it is true that whereas um, the um, extraterrestrials have been coming here for thousands of years in very limited quantities and, and small numbers of species, the traffic began in earnest after the first United States uh, atomic bomb was uh, exploded in the desert uh, and has been increasing since then, off and on, to considerable proportions. And they're concerned because two things. They're afraid we might blow up the world and exterminate the human species. And this is not what they want. And I would hope that not what we want, but it's what could happen to us if we have maniacs uh, making decisions. And we, uh, the problem is, and this is the kind of thing that is difficult to get your head around, the universe is a unity. It's all one big ball of wax. And physicists have found that there's an interconnection between what we do and what happens in other planets elsewhere. And so the, the people who live on other planets have a vested interest in what we do for two reasons. One, I think they like to come here and visit. It could be like the, you know, their extended uh, vacation or uh, <clears throat> longest vacation or whatever. Or it could be just exploration, like climbing a mountain or something like that, there are motives. Um, it could be access to resources, which has been claimed going back uh, that they've been interested in our gold for thousands of years. Um, it could be all of those things, but it is also because the wavelengths that are set off by an atomic weapon just keep going right out into the cosmos. And consequently, they're of real and direct interest to other sentient beings all over the cosmos. And consequently, they don't want us to
to do that because I've used the, uh, the parallel of children playing with matches. You're likely to set the house on fire. And that's where we are today. <clears throat> and I was real, frankly, I was very, very disappointed when President Barack Obama, for whom I had great hopes, which were not realized, a lot of the Americans just uh, recently, when I say recently, in the, in the maybe three or four years ago, starting in 2017, working backwards, uh, to build a huge new plant to develop new atomic weapons and to improve old ones. It should never have happened. And it was quite contrary to what he had said when he entered politics, that we have to get the supplies down and get rid of this threat to ourselves and to our neighbors. That is the reason, and there are other weapons now that have been developed um, as a right result probably of, uh, of interaction with the uh, some of the ETs, which are every bit as bad and maybe even worse, that could be used against us if we have a false attack. And I should explain what I'm talking about because it's important. Long ago, like back in those early post-war years, there were a lot of Nazi scientists who were brought into the United States uh, under what was called Operation Paperclip. And um, they were put to work doing all sorts of things, <clears throat> working on missiles and, uh, and atomic weapons and, uh, and finally anti-gravity machines the, like flying saucers and so on. They became a very part, important part of what has become known as the, the cabal and the U.S. alternate government or invisible government, whatever you want to call it. It's, I call it the cabal. And they, um, they were really, I guess, partly at least responsible, if not totally responsible, for the policy of perpetual war on the part of the United States. And this was, it wasn't accidental that, you know, when the U.S. ran out of one war that they would start another one. It was part of policy. And one of the spokesmen in this subject that I think is the most credible and uh, is Dr. Carol Rosen, who is quoting Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was a Nazi, but I think he mellowed in his senior years, his dying years, and for four years before he died, he had Carol speak for him. At least he would tell her what was going to happen, probably even at some risk to himself because he was giving away some very sensitive stuff. And he said, there, there's going to be one enemy after another because there has to be an enemy in order to justify obscene expenditures on armaments. The U.S. had no enemies that could come anywhere near them in a military sense. So they didn't need to spend hundreds of billions of dollars and trillions of dollars to the point where they even lost two trillion. Can you imagine losing two trillion dollars? <laughs> Where did it go? Well, I mean, if, if you want to know where it went, went into the space uh, program, most likely, about 99% for, uh, for sure. <clears throat> but <clears throat> this, this was part of a long range plan. And uh, he said, the first enemy will be the communists. So you, if you were reading the papers, you'd find out what terrible people the communists were. And I'm not saying that the Russians are 
all lily pure because they're not. They they are. Their KGB was one of the most rotten organizations you can imagine, and they were out to push their philosophy on as much of the world as they could. I'm not denying that, and that is known, and nobody should try and avoid the the reality of what they would like to have achieved, and probably still would if they could, but uh, they've run into some, some problems along the way. But the new gang set up a CIA based on the KGB, and they are, in my opinion, they have all the bad tricks and more. And they are right in there, and they're part of this philosophy of finding an enemy, creating an enemy, in order to justify the expenditure of hundreds of billions of dollars on weapons, which wouldn't be the case otherwise. <clears throat> so Werner von Braun says the first enemy will be the communists, and as a matter of fact, Today, in 2017, you can see them almost, the U.S. almost repeating that, creating anti-Russian um, sentiment by worrying about the interference that they had in the U.S. election. And I, uh, it takes quite a bit to get me to chuckle these days, but I really chuckled at the at the Americans being so upset about somebody interfering in their election when they've been doing the same thing to other countries for 50 or 60 years. Almost every election that wasn't going to go their way, they've tried to interfere, and I know that because they interfered one Canadian election, which I was involved, so I know exactly what, what happened. <clears throat> and then he said, the second enemy will be the terrorists. <clears throat> And uh, so, when they didn't have enough terrorists, if you go back to the days of George W. Bush, um, Osama bin Laden told him what the price of peace would be. And he said, no, this is all, all you have to do, is have a fair, a just settlement of the Palestinian question. And secondly, stop interfering in Middle East business, and three, get your troops out of what we call sacred soil. In other words, off, away from the uh, Arab countries that they were operating in. And that's all you need for peace, and you will be left totally alone. Well, of course, instead of accepting that, George W. Bush said, uh, no, what they're, they're, they're jealous of our free elections and jealous of our our standard of living and all this sort of thing were just uh, absolute nonsense because uh, the, if they had known anything about the Arab people and about the, the Islamic religion, they would know that that's just not where they're coming from. And uh, so there were only a handful of terrorists even then before the Americans might have got rid of those by complying with a very reasonable request that Osama bin Laden actually made. But instead of going that route and having peace in the world, which was possible, they said, we don't have enough terrorists. And what we have, we could, or so few that we could look after them by intelligence and police uh, means. And uh, so, uh, we'll have to do something to stir the pot, stick a poker in the, uh, in the beehive. And so they dreamed up 9-11. In a, in a document called the uh, Plan for a New American Century that the Pentagon had produced, um, they talked about these things of getting really control of that area so that the Chinese and the Russians couldn't and uh, said they had this very ambitious program, but they were afraid the American people wouldn't buy it. And they said, um, um, in the lack of something comparable to Pearl Harbor. Harbor. Now, I actually read the, the uh, document when that was in. Later, they took it out because it was kind of 
evidence against uh, the powers that be and, and confirmed the fact that uh, they were plotting something and that something was 9-11. So 9-11 creates the atmosphere, the, the, the situation requiring retaliation. And a very large percentage of the American people, I think it was 28%, but I can't remember the figure exactly, but a very large percentage of the American people wanted to nuke them. Well, they were going to nuke the wrong people. That game was put up by the United States and its friends. And the result, as soon as the bombs started dropping on Baghdad, they went from a handful of terrorists to thousands. And they've been increasing ever since. Because Americans have been dropping bombs on people and using drones to try and assassinate a person and maybe killing 20 or 30 innocent people in the process. And so, put yourself in the in the position of the people who are getting killed, their relatives and so on, you would get really angry. Say, hey, what are these people doing? What kind of a moral system have they got when they're killing us and we have no protection? So they created these um, terrorists by the thousand. And then, <clears throat> this is one of the worst things that I can I have great difficulty forgiving them for. They invoked a section of NATO, which they said, which was only there to be used in the event of an attack on one of the NATO countries, presumably by another country. But on the basis of those two little planes, the origin of which is very obscure, they said NATO now you're going to have to help us fight terrorists. And we want you to buy more munitions and beef up your armies and so on to help us fight this terrorist threat that extends all around the world. Manufactured madness. That's what it was. Manufactured madness. And instead of going the way of peace, we just have been going in the opposite way. And well then, after that, according to Von Braun, I've, Carol Rosen actually uh, put another one in the, uh, the, the book that I referred to of, uh, of Stephen Greer, of satellites. And there was a time, I didn't pay any attention to this, when the papers were telling us we had to be concerned about a satellite that might uh, possibly affect the Earth. <clears throat> Consequently, we should have uh, spent a lot of money on protections to uh, do something about it if it got too close and was going to be a threat. <clears throat> that has faded into the woodwork. And the final uh, pièce de résistance, as we say, um, was to be the threat of the extraterrestrials. And they have been working on this for years and years and years. <clears throat> Dr. Greer has risked his life by exposing this. And uh, they, have, they have built a fleet of airships capable of going around the world and attacking cities just as if they were coming from outside the earth <clears throat> with the end of taking over the world. That is the aim of the game. And somehow, first of all, we have got to understand what is going on. And then we have got to persuade the American people and especially the American Congress that they have to do something about it because they're the one that's putting up the money to keep this threat alive and to risk the fate of all of the earth. Now, you've mentioned before there's uh, numerous alien species. Uh, we always hear about not only human abductions, but these cattle mutilations where it appears uh, 
there's been highly advanced uh, operations performed on these cattle. Um, is there any particular species that might be responsible for these abductions? I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say so. Uh, the American signed uh, agreements, I think, with a couple of species <clears throat> that they could uh, do a certain amount of that in order to, uh, in exchange for uh, technology. But then there was no control that the, the uh, visitors were supposed to give them lists of the people who had been abducted. And, um, and so, uh, of course, that was never done, or certainly not uh, lists that were accurate. And um, I think, uh, I don't want to pinpoint anyone, but I do want to mention that the mutilations and the abductions didn't end with the visitors. They were taken over by the United States forces. And they have created clones of beings that look like extraterrestrials. And they have abducted people who have been confronted by these clones and given the impression <clears throat> that they had been, been uh, abducted by extraterrestrials, when in fact they were being abducted by the American Space Command. And so uh, it's getting very complicated because there's, when you have so many species from different parts of the cosmos coming, and with different plans and, uh, and different uh, points of view. And some of them, you asked a question earlier about would they intervene? Uh, they only know, but they have one or two cases, uh, occasions. They have cut the atomic warheads from one or two missiles that have been launched. So uh, the answer is they could and might intervene. We just don't know. But we shouldn't rely on them for protection. We should try and clean up our own act. Because to say that the extraterrestrials have been the threat so far is not true because they could have taken us over any time they wanted to. No problem. Still could. Um, but. Um, and that's because they're so much further advanced from us. We, we don't even really know where they're from exactly, but they have the ability to come here. So there's nothing realistically we could do to defend ourselves uh, that, should they want. That's absolutely true. They're so far advanced that they could, uh, even when our people now are so far advanced, relatively speaking, after 50 or 60 years, that they can shoot them down, some of them. Um, they still couldn't fight a war against most of the extraterrestrial species, which are still far, far more sophisticated than we are. They're, so they're way ahead of us still. And to take them on for size is, is, would be absolute total folly because We've got some people who think they're so smart they can do anything, you know, and uh, they can't, and they shouldn't try, and they have to come sometime soon to the to the realization that man wasn't put on the earth just to have the fun of killing his fellow fellow human beings. That this is what we're all about. That um, we were created to work together, to be cooperative, to be caring, to love each other, to feed each other when, when someone's hungry. And there, there are millions of people in Africa this year who risk starving to death when we sat idly by and did very little. Some of us did a little bit, but very little. And Lots of them that, who need roofs over their heads and medical attention and so on. These are the things that we should have been doing to, for the benefit of our species, uh, which is an experiment, 
instead of saying, well, we're going to have the next and biggest empire in the history of the world, it's going to be greater than the Roman Empire, and we're going to run the show exclusively. And if it means wiping out a large proportion of the people on Earth, why well, so be it. Too many people already. Well, there are only too many people already is because <clears throat> we don't share the food, we don't share the medical attention, <clears throat> and we didn't take advantage of an offer which was made to General Eisenhower to give us that kind of peace and, and opportunity. So we've, we've made wrong choices all the way along the, the line. And we've been going our merry way as if power and greed were the predominant characteristics of our species instead of love and caring, compassion, and mutual cooperation, which is what the Creator intended. So, which way are we going to go? And that's kind of where, uh, where we're sitting at the moment, because are we going to do what we have to do to avoid this catastrophe that a handful of very sick people are planning to do to us? There are people in the Pentagon that actually think they can have a nuclear war with Russia and live to tell the tale. Well, they're psychopathic. It's impossible. It will not happen because there are so many checks and balances. But even though they don't believe that there's mutual assured destruction, which is, has been the plan for 50 years or so since the, the uh, atomic weapons became widespread, there are it's, uh, more than enough of them around in submarines and elsewhere that it would be. And millions and millions of the U.S. population would be wiped out if they were ever silly enough, the people of the Pentagon, who have been running the show for so long, to start an atomic war with Russia. And let heaven forbid that they are allowed to do that. But first of all, we have to be aware of what they're planning. And it's been reported in a couple interviews that you've mentioned there's a federation of alien species. Um, do all of the uh, alien species kind of uh, work together, or is there warring species that war with each other? Well, I, I only know about the Galactic Federation, and I don't know much about it, so I shouldn't talk about it. But they are concerned about what's going on in the world. And they have been working um, through individuals. Um, they'll pick out a few individuals and visit them or talk to them or talk to them telepathically or send uh, information to them uh, by channeling. I have a, a very close friend who was uh, writing a second book right now uh, with channeling from a species called the Pacetas. Very few people have heard of it. They have a, a deal that they won't interfere. But I think that there's also a loophole if things get bad enough that they would make exceptions. But we can't count on them. I mean, maybe we can count on them, but, but we shouldn't count on them because they say, you clean up your act. You're in charge, it's your planet, and if it comes to a dead end, it will be because you let it or made it a dead end. Because it wasn't necessary and you had everything going, it's one of the best planets in the, in the whole universe, and everybody covets the fact that it's so good, and you have been destroying it. And this is, something that we've tried to let you know by various ways over a long period. The individual uh, communications always say, look, there are things you've got to do. 
stop your clear cutting, stop your fracking, stopping, stop using uh, fossil fuels because there are better ways. And I personally keep pushing and pushing for, for clean, zero point energy machines. And in my latest book, uh, the Money Mafia, I insist that we should really try to install zero point energy uh, energy engines in every car, truck, and, uh, and uh, tractor, and motorboat, and airplane, and home in the world in seven years, if we want to save the planet, if we're serious. And we could do it. People say, don't be, don't be silly. Well, I know that we could do it because in World War II, we had to convert every automobile plant, every uh, refrigerator plant, and every washing machine plant into armaments plants to win the war. The war we're faced with now to save our home requires us to do just the opposite, to take every armaments plant and convert it into a plant to build zero point energy engines for cars and trucks and homes and airplanes and so on. And if we did that on a cooperative basis with all of the big powers behind it and all of the rest of us coming along either for the ride or taking our own initiative, we could do it. It's still possible to stop some, a very large part of the damage. Some of it's already irreversible in the short period, but we could still save our own, put the fire out, and have a nice, happy environment for millions and millions of people who live for a long time to come. Will we do it? Well, I don't know. Ask your politician, your MP, your congressman, your whoever represents you, what they're doing to have that come to pass and see what their answers are, and then tell them what you think, if they're not up to speed on it. And there was a big CBC article, and it was on the news across Canada in March of 2013, where the government of Canada came out and said they realized that there is uh, an increasing number of UFO sightings, but the government of Canada is no longer going to be doing any of their own investigations, and instead they're going to be relying on private citizens to investigate these UFOs. Do you think that's a truthful statement that the government of Canada wouldn't really be too concerned about unidentified flying objects flying over their skies? I don't think so. <coughs> Excuse me. I think it's um, typical of the uh, North American influence that our government is just uh, trying to put the people off so we're not uh, not interested because certainly NORAD would be uh, still involved in the business and we're still a member of NORAD. So those uh, sightings would all go uh, into the machine as they have been for the last 60 or 70 years. There's a YouTube video about you. I'm not sure if you know who Joe Rogan is. He's a UFC commentator. He has an extremely popular podcast. He's on numerous uh, television shows in the United States and basically he covers the subject of UFOs uh, sometimes on his podcast and there's a video online that has I guess over 40,000 hits at this point um, where he basically states that you're gullible if you believe the UFO stuff and that because there's lots of videos of you talking on the subject on UFOs on the internet, you must be making money off of speaking on this subject and perhaps you're only in it for the financial rewards of, uh, of speaking on the subject. So because that video is one of the things that pops up when you search your name now, I was just wondering if you uh, had any response. Of course, you answered some of these questions in our interview already but any direct response for, from somebody that's kind of dismissed you 
so thoroughly without really knowing too much about you seemingly? Well, I think uh, he is obviously part of the disinformation clan. Uh, whether he's being paid to do that sort of thing or not, only he would know. I'm not surprised. I haven't seen it. I'm not even the least bit interested in looking at it because I've got better things to do with my time. But I've been telling the truth for the last 12 years. And that's the reason that there are some people who don't want the truth to be told, who have to say that I don't know what the score is. Well, they're absolutely wrong. I have probably made the odd mistake. We're all human. And I might have said one or two things that were misstatements inadvertently. But basically, everything in my book is true. In my books, both the first one on the subject and the broad subjects, the light at the end of the tunnel, the survival plan for the human species, and the latest one, the money mafia, a world in crisis, they are legitimate efforts to let the people know what is going on and to sidetrack all of the liars and all of the government employees and all of the journalists who are being paid by government agencies who are out there to misinform rather than to level with the people the way they should be if they were responsible citizens. So forget him. Um, he is in his own way like NASA trying to misinform rather than to inform and you can get the straight goods from my books and when I make a YouTube if there's a fluff in it forgive me but it will be as legitimate and as honest and as straightforward as I can possibly make it and do I make a lot of money out of it no I haven't, to the best of my knowledge, ever broken even on a book. And I've written 14. If I have, I've, it would, you know, pe peanuts. Because, and most of them have cost me money, some of them thousands of dollars to get out there. But I have a responsibility as a citizen of my country and of the world to try and alert people to how they're being misinformed by people like that and by agencies like NASA and the United States shadow government and the United States government in a way that is not only detrimental to their understanding and their perhaps actions, but could be fatal if they don't get the truth from someone. And you're also in your 90s, you're financially secure, and you're putting your reputation on the line by speaking on these subjects. So obviously, you, it's something you truly believe in. Absolutely. I mean, why? I'm, I just celebrated my 94th birthday. And I have plenty to eat. I help quite a few people who don't and will continue to do so while I have the resources. I am not financially dependent on book selling. I seldom get more than a very small honorarium if I speak anywhere. I think maybe one expe exception, uh, speaking to a financial group, which was, uh, I mean, a good investment of my time. But my problem, I, I don't even normally, and I've difficulty with this, take in enough money to pay the expenses of my office. And I've had to put my own money in, in order to keep up my campaign of trying to let the people really know what's going on. And finally, if a species of extraterrestrials were to reveal themselves in a big way to the public, um, what means do you think they would uh, do to, to do it in a fashion? Uh, would they do it and try and avoid causing panic or how do you think they would do it? Well, this is a hypothetical question. Politicians should learn not to answer hypothetical questions because the answer is I have no idea and I'm not worried about them doing it. I am worried about 
the cabal, the alternate United States government being the ones that do that for the specific purpose of taking over the world and running it as a dictatorship. And I don't believe you personally have any social media. I could be wrong on that, but for anyone watching this that might not be familiar with you, um, where could they find out more about you? I know you have your website. Well, apart from my website, which is usually out of date because I don't have to worry about, time to worry about it, I'm now doing uh, tweets and uh, and blogs, and I hope to do more of those in the in the year to come, in anticipation of the most important book of my life, which will be uh, uh, Hope Restored, and I'm hoping that we can get it out uh, sometime about a year from now. And I personally picked up your light at the end of the tunnel book from the library, so I know it's available in Ontario libraries, but if someone would like to purchase uh, your books, where could they find it? Well, they can get them from Amazon, of course, uh, fast delivery. If they want an autographed pa uh, copy, they can get it from my website, which is uh, paulhellyerweb.com. That's paulhellyerweb.com. And uh, the, uh, we send them out as quickly as we can. And uh, I'll autograph, uh, for, uh, autograph it for you at the same time. So I don't make, this is not my business, but I sold quite a few books from the website from people who want to, uh, to obtain them that way. And uh, you're more than welcome to try uh, that route. And you've made a few statements to the public watching this video during this interview. In 1940, the Council on Foreign Relations in Washington, D.C. decided that, the, uh, that Hitler was going to lose the war and that they should start preparing for the next empire, an American empire. And it was to comprise all of the area that Hitler had coveted, including the United Kingdom, all of North America, New Zealand, Australia, and much of the Southeast Pacific Rim. And they've been working at it ever since. They have linked forces with uh, other organizations since, including the Bilderbergers, a post-war organization uh, in Europe, which is the most secretive and one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, organization in the world today. And then the third, the Trilateral Commission, which was formed after uh, Japan uh, began its uh, ascendancy. And these three have been working together, and I call them in my books, the Three Sisters. They are the sort of the root of what I now call cabal, and other people call it the cabal as well. The cabal comprises the banking cartel, the oil cartel, the big transnational corporations, the intelligence agencies, many of them, but including the CIA, the FBI, the NSA, and a couple of foreign ones of the MI6 from the UK and uh, the Mossad from uh, Israel and a huge slice of the American military. And they are the cabal, and they have been running the United States for the last half century to the point where presidents have been little more than talking heads, and the Congress hasn't had a clue as to what was going on. After World War II, it was a, an operation called Operation Paperclip, which was um, approved by President Truman to bring Nazi scientists to the United States to help, presumably, in the Cold War that would uh, ensue. President Truman agreed on the condition 
that none of the scientists were to have been active members of the Nazi party. The armed forces who were doing the invitation, the army in particular, uh, paid no attention to the president. As a former minister of national defense, I know how that works. <laughs> and uh, they recruited the ones they wanted. They gave them new names, new histories, and high-ranking jobs in the United States in the military and civil establishments. They were working on missiles and, uh, and uh, new, new weapon systems of various kinds. Well, then after the cra two crashes at Roswell, two UFO crashes at Roswell on July the 4th, 1947, one of the machines was sufficiently intact to be recovered, and they began back engineering that. Before long, they moved the operation to Nevada. And the president then was Eisenhower, and he wanted to know what they were doing out there, and they wouldn't tell him. So he threatened to send in the first army from Colorado. And they capitulated and allowed him to send four trusted members of the CIA to visit Colorado and uh, see what was going on. Well, what was going on was exactly what they really expected, and that is the back engineering of one of the vehicles from the Roswell area. I don't think there's been a president since, well, actually Truman, who has really been in the loop, totally. President Eisenhower vented his frustration in his final speech to the American people at the time he was retiring from public life. He said, beware of the military-industrial complex. And the problem is we have paid no attention to him. An eyewitness who had worked in the company of uh, President Eisenhower said what he was really concerned about was that the ET file had fallen into the wrong hands. And that's what he was really concerned about, and I wish he had said it. But that's, I guess, when the cover-up really got underway in earnest. Well, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. This cabal, their end game, is a world government. They're calling it the New World Order, which is unelected and accountable only to them. That's what they're doing. And they're well on the road to do it. And you know, they were smart. They said, we won't do what Hitler did and try to take over all this world, uh, these countries, by military means. We will do it by using our brains and using the monetary system to crush the various countries to, to the point where the people will be glad to uh, accept uh, a military government. And we will use trade agreements which are not really trade agreements, but which are, in effect, transfers of power from the people, the elected people, to the banking cartel and the transnational corporations. And they put a thing in the trade agreements, which is called the dispute settlement mechanism. And it actually works this way that if any government, like a provincial government in Canada or a state government in the United States, does something that affects the profits or potential profits of a foreign company, they can sue the government of Canada. 
for lost prophets or even lost pro potential prophets, can you believe? They have more rights in Canada than Canadian citizens. And of course, it works the same way with the United States. It's wrong in principle. Two final words. The reason they don't want us to know what they're doing is because of too many of us knew what they were doing. They might not be able to get away with it. And the reason that you don't read about it is that if you get a copy of Daniel Estulin's most recent book, he was the writer of the true story of the Bilderberger. There are several pages, chapter and verse, that show that every major news outlet in the English-speaking world is controlled by a Bilderberger. Thank you very much. <laughs>